In this lecture, we're going to talk about the first law of thermodynamics. Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this, there's a series of laws of thermodynamics. We're going to do the first and the second law, um, which are the kind of the two, the two major ones that we talked about. Um, and this one deals basically with a lot of the things that we've been talking about already, but kind of formalizes some of the things we've done. Um, we, we've actually already done half of this. Um, <clears throat> we know that um, there are various types of energy, right? There's work, there's kinetic energy, there's potential energy, and there's heat energy. Um, and they can all be converted from one to another, right? We, can, we know that we can convert kinetic energy to heat energy, potential energy to kinetic energy, and just kind of move all those things around. Um, <clears throat> all, the, all the first law basically is a restatement of uh, conservation of energy that says, well, you can actually do this process kind of backwards in that you can actually convert heat into work, basically. You can use um, heat to basically generate work. Um, this shouldn't be super surprising to you. This is actually how we do most of our, uh, a lot of our work. Uh, an enormous number of our engines are done, are used this way. And this is actually basically how we generate all of our electricity. Um, almost all of our electricity is created through heat engines, uh, whether those be uh, coal burning plants or nuclear power plants or, um, or you know, uh, natural gas power plants. All of these are basically different ways of converting heat into work, um, which we then use as electricity. Um, so the first law of thermodynamics is this. It basically says um, that there's this thing called the internal energy of a system. Um, internal energy of a system, I always used to get confused by this. Uh, I, I never quite understood it, but it's basically just all the energy that you have um, in some system. All right, So it's basically just accounting for all of it. Um, and you normally don't have to worry too much about adding up all the different energy in the system. Normally what you're interested in is what the change in it is. Um, and so, uh, this, and, and we'll see this a little more, more concrete um, in general, but it basically says that if I take all the energy in a system, um, uh, if I add heat into it, um, I can either increase the energy of the system, uh, which would be the delta U, or I can basically put work out of the system. And so that's this minus work done by the system. So the other way to think about this is that um, uh, the the if if you're putting in if you're putting in Q, it can go one of two ways. It can either increase the energy. So if you put in heat to a system, it can increase the internal energy. Like when I heat a cup of coffee, I'm basically putting in heat, and that increases the internal energy of the of the of the coffee. Um, or I can put in heat, and I can do work. Um, I can have work done by the system. And this is what we're doing. Let's say with a car engine, is basically we put some heat into the into it by, by burning some gasoline and then we have the the engine do work uh, on uh, the outside environment so the system is doing work um, you're gonna have to watch out a little bit with this sign this minus is here only when work is done by the system basically this is work that's going out of uh, the whatever system we're talking about um, and again this should be a, a little clearer as we go ahead so, so if you're a little confused about these various terms uh, hopefully we'll clarify it as we go through and again, this is really just a simple restating of the cons of, uh, conservation of energy. Basically, these are just all different energies, right? Work is energy, um, Q is thermal energy, um, and this is just the internal energy of the system. Okay, so this is how it's often um, shown, is that you can basically add some heat into a system, um, and again, you either increase the internal energy or you do some work out. You can also actually do work on a system um, and either increase the energy or heat on it. Um, if you think about it, if you remember when I did that example um, in class where I, where I basically um, made uh, the, the piece of paper catch on fire by slamming on a plunger, what I did in that case is I actually did work on the system. So, so um, this is actually, an, an, that would be a negative work. Uh, so so it would be minus a negative work, so a positive work. Basically, I did work positive work on the system. Um, and what I did was I actually increased the internal energy of the system to the point where it actually, um, you know, it actually caught on fire. Um, and so, so again, you can also do work on the system and, and increase the internal energy that way, or you can, um, or you can basically have work go out of the system. Again, there's just various ways of basically stuff coming in and out of um, the system. Basically, you can either have heat go in or out and work go in or out. Um, and whichever one that is, and however those things add up, you get a change in internal energy. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's try to do a slightly more specific example, um, although although it's, it may it still may not be super satisfying. 
Um, food is actually how we get, we increase our internal energy. So we basically just, so food has internal energy and it has calories in it. Um, we basically just eat it. Okay. So we put the internal energy into, it's basically chemical energy into our stomachs. And then what <clears throat> our body does is any, any change in internal energy, basically any, any food that's put into our bodies, um, we then, we then do one of two things with it. We either do work using that food. So basically we've increased our internal energy um, to, get, to get it back to, we can't keep increasing our internal energy forever because uh, basically uh, in, in terms of us, um, our internal energy is one of the big things of, of our internal energy. Um, uh, so that there are kind of two ways we, we have internal energy. We either um, increase our internal energy by increasing our heat, which of course we don't do. We let our heat stay the same. And so if we, if we eat more food um, and increase internal energy, we either need to work it off, okay, so I'm um, doing exercise, or we need to, to basically produce more heat. We need to basically sweat more uh, of it out. Um, if we don't, um, if let's say I eat uh, 100 calories, so I increase my internal energy by 100 calories, and I don't do work or, um, or expend heat that's equal to that energy that I've basically just put in, then my internal energy increases. Um, of course, what's it mean for my internal energy increase? It means I'm storing more energy inside of me. Of course, we store energy in fat. Um, this is basically how we gain weight. Um, we gain weight whenever basically the work and the heat that we output isn't equal to the, <clears throat> our change in internal energy that we've had by basically eating food. Um, and so to, to, to maintain your weight, um, to basically not, not get heavier, not, not gain um, energy, not gain mass, um, you basically have to have uh, the amount of energy you take in from food equal to the work and the, and the heat that you put out, um, which again, we already kind of know, but just kind of just formalizing it. Um, of course, plants do something a little different. They actually take in heat from the sun. And it's actually, you know, thermal energy from the sun. They take in heat from the sun and turn that into internal energy because of course, plants um, actually want to gain weight, right? They start as a little seed um, and they want to become a full tree uh, or plant or whatever you want to call it. And to do that, they basically have to increase their internal energy, basically create a bunch of new cells, things like that. Um, they also put out a small amount of energy as well uh, because they're not a perfectly efficient system. Okay, and that's just the idea of how we, um, how, how basically it is. Again, uh, plants take in heat um, and, and turn it into an increase in internal energy. We just take in internal energy basically directly uh, by, by eating food and then turn it into work and, and, um, and heat. Um, I, I always got, you know, one thing you can always get, you can get pretty confused by is what this works thing is. You know, of course, work means a lot of different things. As we found out, it's kind of just anything that we're doing to kind of change, um, you know, the, the kinetic energy of something or the potential energy of it. Um, you know, when we lift things, we're doing work. When we're pushing on things, we're doing work. Of course, friction does work. Um, there are a lot of different kinds, but actually for a lot of the processes that we're gonna talk about in, in this, this first law part, we're actually gonna look at basically gases pushing on various things. And again, this is because that's actually how many of our engines actually work. Um, and so we're gonna, there are a lot of different ones and you can find them in your book, but because it, it, it isn't actually that important what the different ones are, we're just gonna look at one, which is this process called iso, um, uh, iso, that's not right, it's not isochoric, it's iso, it's isobaric. So isobaric, um, uh, so we're just gonna look at where it's isobaric or, or under constant pressure. Um, uh, and uh, in that case, work is just equal to pressure times the change in volume. Okay, so basically the work that's done by the gas on the system um, it's just the work, uh, the, the pressure times the change in the volume. Um, so let me just do an example so I can show you. This is going to look at kind of um, how a car works. Um, so we're going to have an ideal gas uh, in a chamber that has a piston. And we're basically going to add 1,600 joules of heat into the gas uh, through some means, whether it's by catching something on fire or whatever, it doesn't really matter. We're going to add the 1,600 joules of gas um, and we're going to keep it at, at one atmosphere of pressure all the time. Basically, we're going to we're going to adjust this piston so that the pressure inside of here is always one atmosphere. Um, and when this happens, what we're going to find is that the internal energy of the gas is increased by 500 joules. But what we want to know is 
how much work was done by the guest and how much did the volume increase, okay? So again, there's 1,600 joules coming into the, the system. Um, the, the internal energy of the gas, of this ideal gas inside of here is increased by 500 joules. And then we're also going to do some work as well. Um, so again, we can go back to this equation uh, that just says the change in internal energy um, is equal to the heat, in this case, added to the system minus the work done by the system. Um, we've added, uh, our, our internal energy has increased by 500 joules. Our, um, our, our, we, we said that we put 1,600 joules of heat into the system. Um, and so if we solve basically for the work done by the system, we just get that the work done by the system is 1,100 joules. Okay, we basically just subtract that over and get rid of our negative signs. And so the system has done, uh, the, the, the gas has basically done 1,100 joules of work um, if we put in 1,600 joules of, of uh, heat and only 500 joules of internal energy increase. Um, we can also go back to our constant pressure th um, uh, equation to figure out how much um, the volume increased um, and realize that, well, we had 1,100 joules of work um, done. Um, again, we had this constant pressure of 10 to the fifth pascals, um, and then we can just solve for the volume and find out that the volume, change of volume, basically was 0 0.011 cubic meters. Um, so basically, they had increased by volume, uh, in volume by about 11 uh, liters or so. Um, so it's a pretty good, pretty good size uh, change in volume. Um, for uh, for for this this um, this problem, so that's kind of how we do this uh, these types of things. Basically, it's a way again for us to start to think about how engines work and how these different um, processes work. But again, it's not necessarily any new physics. It's just kind of a conservation of energy restated in a slightly different way. The reason we're interested in this stuff is actually due to looking at engines. One of the big reasons that any of this stuff got, got created in the first place was because people were looking at engines. Um, this is just an example that I have here of a, of, this is actually a, um, a, a car engine. This is your, your, the engines in your car basically work this way. Um, basically what happens is some gas comes in, uh, it pushes on the gas, the gas gets, gets ignited, which pushes the, thing, the piston back out, and then you push the exhaust, exhaust off. And so we have, again, gas ignition pushing the piston, um, and then you push the gas off. Um, this is called a four-stroke engine. Basically, there are four different um, parts to it uh, before it repeats again, um, and, and that's why it's called a four-stroke engine or, or a four-part engine. Um, again, there's this, this uh, injection of the fuel, the compression, that what's called the power stroke, and then the, the exhaust stroke. Um, and so... The, it, the important thing about engines is that they actually can't um, increase, they can't have a change in internal energy and they, 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 throughout the whole cycle. And the reason for that is that you have to basically start back, um, uh, start back at the beginning at the end of each cycle. In other words, you can't have your engine, for instance, constantly heating up um, because if it kept heating up and heating up and heating up, eventually, of course, it would, uh, it would melt all the metal inside of the thing. Um, and uh, so, so basically it has to be able to start back at the same place it started. Um, and so the, for the whole system, once the car gets warmed up, basically you should have that the, the change in internal energy is zero for the engine system. Um, and so that, that's true for all heat engines or, or any type of real engine is that they can't, they can't actually have a change in their internal energy. Um, and and they, they're made to basically produce work from heat. Okay, so again, what we're doing with a car engine is we basically create a bunch of heat when we ignite the gas, um, the, the, the fuel uh, air mixture, and then uh, we basically um, uh, produce a, a, a bunch of heat. Um, that heat basically produces work, uh, and that work is what pushes our car forward. All right, so that's basically how our engines work. Of course, in real life, uh, just, just so that you have some idea about how, uh, in case you're interested about how an actual um, car engine works, uh, most of your cars are, are, are four-cylinder uh, cars or, or higher, um, and so they, they're doing what I just showed, but they're doing it uh, with four at the same time um, and, and all going and synchronized in a very specific way. Um, when your car actually starts running poorly, it's because uh, um, it, it's often because one or, or more of these uh, things are, are acting poorly, but the rest of them are still going. And when your engine's running rough, that's basically what's happening is that uh, only some of these are working. Anyway.
Okay, so going back to these heat engines, um, what you have is you basically have some, some heat energy coming in, basically comes in whenever we ignite the gas, some work comes out, but then we actually, um, we, we sometimes have uh, energy coming out. Um, again, if you just write your delta U is equal to Q plus W, um, uh, again, if delta U is equal to zero, then you just get that the work is equal to basically the, the amount of heat that comes, the net amount of heat that's, that's been brought in. Um, again, though, we actually are pushing heat out as well. So basically we have the, wor the total work done is equal to the Q in uh, minus the Q out. Um, of course, in a car engine, the Q out is basically all this heat that goes out when you push the air out of the exhaust, the, the exhaust out of the engine. And you know that you're wasting actually a lot of uh, this thermal energy in a, in a car engine. And you know that because uh, the exhaust that comes out of your car is quite hot. Um, you shouldn't touch the exhaust pipe on your car. You'll, you'll burn yourself uh, because they're, they're quite hot. If you were using all of the, um, uh, all of this, uh, all of the energy perfectly, uh, basically you shouldn't push any heat out at the end. Um, there shouldn't be any extra heat uh, coming out at the end. Um, but that, of course, that's not, that's not what happens in, in real life. Um, uh, there's actually a way to quantify uh, how, how, um, uh, what the efficiency is of an engine. Uh, and the way you do that is by basically you take the amount of heat that you've put into the car. Um, that's, that's basically the, the energy that's coming into it. And you, you put the work divided by that energy that goes into it. So basically what you're saying is that um, if I had all of the heat that I put into it go directly into work, I would have perfect efficiency, or the E would equal to 1. So the, the highest this, this E can be is 1. Efficiency can be 1 or 100%. Um, and that's if all of the heat energy went directly into work. Um, of course, the lowest efficiency I could have is if, if I put heat in and I didn't get any work out. Basically, all the heat in went directly to the heat, to the heat out. And in that case, the work would equal 0. Um, and then, of course, that, that's a perfectly inefficient engine, which would, isn't, we, we, don't want to, we don't want to build, of course. Um, it turns out because the work is just Q, the, the heat in minus the Q, uh, the heat in minus the heat out, um, we can basically substitute Q in minus Q out in for the work, and then we get that the efficiency can also be called 1 minus the Q out divided by the Q in, or 1 minus the heat out minus the heat in. Again, if the heat out is zero, we get perfect the efficiency if the heat in, um, if the if the um, if the heat out is the same as heat in, um, then we get that the efficiency is zero. So again, that's when they're not doing any work. It turns out that for um, uh, for very specific cases, for a very specific type of engine um, uh, called a Carnot engine, um, you can actually turn these into temperatures. And what you find is that the efficiency is always um, uh, is always uh, less than or equal to for a Carnot cycle. Um, one minus the the temperature of the hot thing, so basically the hottest temperature you have in here during that spark, divided by the cold temperature of basically um, the, the 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 stuff that you're you're pulling in, uh, basically the the or, or and the stuff that you're putting out. So basically the coldest um, the, the the it's what's called the cold reservoir, basically where you're taking your um, uh, your uh, thing that you're heating up from. Uh, and, and you put the uh, temperature of the hot side on top of it. Um, most processes aren't Carnot engines, um, but it actually gives you a good idea. You can actually find um, it, the, the Carnot engines are what are called the most efficient engines, uh, heat engine you can have out there. So if you calculate this, this efficiency, which is called the Carnot efficiency, um, nothing that you have in, uh, nothing that you make will ever get better efficiency than this Carnot efficiency. So this is kind of the maximum theoretical efficiency uh, if you have a hot thing and a cold thing, um, and you're trying to find what the what the maximum energy, uh, efficiency you can have is. Um, this always gets a little confusing when we do it in the abstract. So let's let's do an actual example. So we have a gasoline engine that has um, a 250 degree hot reservoir. Basically, that means that the inside of the burning fuel gets up to 200. The inside of that chamber gets to 250 degrees C uh, when when the the spark ignites. And uh, our cold reservoir, basically what, what we're using for, um, to, to bring in uh, that, that the thing that we're heating up is basically the outside air, which we're going to say is just at room temperature. Of course, if it's a cold day, it'll actually be even colder than that. But um, So then we can calculate, well, what's the efficiency of a car um, when the engine's really hot um, and, and we have this kind of cold air coming in? 
uh, what's its maximum theoretical efficiency? Again, we can just say that efficiency is equal to one minus the hot side of things divided by the cold side of things. And we get that technically if we had um, an engine that had a 250 degree hot side, 22 degree cold side, um, uh, you could actually get up to 77% uh, efficiency if, you were, if, it, if this was a, a well running, uh, you know, uh, again, Carnot style engine. We won't worry about what Carnot engines look like, but um, if it was this, this kind of special engine, uh, that, that's, the, that's the best engine you can make, you get 77% efficiency. Um, you notice that's still not 100% efficiency, so even the, the maximum theoretical efficiency you can get with this uh, is 77%. Um, it, you'll notice that the way that you actually make engines more efficient is by making the hot side much hotter and the cold side much colder. Um, this is why, by the way, actually when your car is warming up, it's actually least efficient. Um, so when you first start your car, um, it's actually it actually runs uh, at lower efficiencies, and that's because you're actually you're not kind of your your car actually isn't getting as hot at the beginning um, as as it is at the um, as it, as it can be, um, and so uh, so it, it's um, so this is the idea of, of kind of, um, of of you know why especially in the old days you used to have to warm up cars. Um, uh, the um, this also just goes to show you that if you really increase your temperature a lot. Um, of your hot side and your cold and decrease your cold temperature a lot um, you can you can maximize your efficiency um, and so that's kind of theoretically how you tend to tend to make things work better um, of course in real life gasoline engines are not Carnot engines they're, they're actually a, a different type of engine um, that I won't go into um, in real life their efficiency are closer to 20 or 30 percent um, this is part of why we're trying to move away uh, from um, from gasoline engines um, actually, a lot of our power plants tend to run uh, much better efficiencies and actually tend to be more similar to Carnot engines. And so, um, even though uh, we'd be, we might be using, a, you know, if we switch to, let's say, electric vehicles, we're not necessarily um, uh, doing less work. We can get much better efficiencies because basically we're running our power plants, which have much higher efficiencies than um, our, our car engines do. Um, part of the reason we don't care about how um, how efficient our car engines are, by the way, is just because gasoline is so cheap. So, okay. Um, still, the, the 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 real point is that it's better to have hot engines that are that are cooled more on the outside. So you're best to have a very hot uh, a very hot thing and a very cold thing um, whenever you're whenever you're trying to do your best uh, heat engine. Um, so that's about it. Um, uh, all I got. It, it, I just want you to get a couple of big things. Yes. So the internal energy is just the, uh, the 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 is just the heat that comes in the system minus the work done by the system. Um, and again, it's just simple conservation of energy. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about heat engines, uh, which are what most of our engines are, uh, which is just uh, the change in internal energy. Um, equal to zero, basically they have to go back to, to where they started and we found out that we can calculate what the efficiencies are um, exactly and do an approximation just um, based on what the various temperatures of the parts of the engine are. I hope that was useful um, and we'll do some great examples in class about all different kinds of heat engines. All right.